Welcome to this seminar in person and online. And it is my pleasure to have today uh, our Alumni Award winner 2024. That is Her Excellency Dr. Florence Grace Adongo from Uganda, who is an executive director of the Nal Basin Initiative. And uh, Dr. Adongo has studied at IHE Delft in 95, uh, 1995, 1997, in, and she followed and completed the MSc in Water and Environment Resources Management. And today, she will give us a presentation about water resources management in rapidly changing environment. Without further ado, Florence, don't go the floor is yours. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure to present to you this very topic on water resources management in a changing, rapidly changing environment. My purpose is really to share with you how IHE Delve added value and transformed my career in this particular area and influenced my professional growth with positive impact to society. The conviction I had after leaving this place with a lot of knowledge gain, and I will also give you in some cases some additions on this, my story. Uh, I will uh, look briefly at the historical snapshot for Uganda Water Resources Management, contributions that I, with other people, have made and acknowledgements. Um, we live in a, a world of diversity and a dynamic environment in very many ways. But for the focus of this presentation, I'm looking at the hydrological systems, impact of climate change, socioeconomic impacts, cultural, geopolitical, you know, technological, and the legal environments. Amidst population growth, urbanization, industrialization, pollution, and many other environmental degradation issues. We all know that water is a resource which is very unique and strategic for developments. But in most cases, it is treated like it is an environmental issue only, and yet it's very important for sustainable development. I've looked at water in a multi-pronged benefits from the economic perspective, political, catalytic in terms of economic development, ecological water, and I also looked at it from the level of water shared in basins which attract corporate cooperation. It is, according to the UN World Water Development uh, Report 2016, three quarters of jobs in the world is linked to water. So water is very pivotal in socioeconomic development and is also important in transiting to green development. When you look at the sustainable development goal, water is at the center and it is extremely important that it is optically, optimally managed to harness the best out of it. I will not go through this because uh, I thought I would have uh, the new, <laughs> new, new participants here, but uh, I think uh, we all know that uh, the best way to uh, harness water due to the very multiple uh, benefits that it has and the multi-sectoral needs. You have to undertake integrated water resources management with a goal to maximize economic social welfare <coughs> in an equitable manner without compromising the benefits of the environment but also the future generation. In that case, the IWRM uh, looks at policies and action plan, legal frameworks, institutional framework, capacity and uh, capabil capabilities, but also looking at various management tools so that it can together honest, uh, help the countries to honest. And this is the kind of architect that the Uganda Water Resources Management has taken. The resources, if you look at Uganda, 
although there's a bit some degradation, you think that Uganda doesn't have any problem with the water resources because of the drainage system. But it is found that it is unevenly distributed and it's sometimes the wetlands that have the water are seasonal and the forest cover by far has reduced to 13%. Wetlands is 9 and from 13. And the annual rainfall varies and therefore there's a problem. The water is shared among other countries. Uganda's water resources is wholly transboundary. That means that while the country is using the water, they should be mindful of other users that share the same water. So this becomes a very delicate balance. Now, in the, at the Earth Summit in 1999, resolutions were made to manage the water resources better. In this Earth Summit, I was wondering, I didn't see women, so I was asking myself, but uh, in the Dublin principle, one of the core principle, number three, is that uh, women should be recognized in the management of the water. So after this Rio conference, that is when Uganda actually started in a more structured way, the management of the water resources. And it was the first country to prepare a water action plan that guided a, a, the adoption of the international integrated water resources management and guided water resources development and management and also guided the legal policy framework uh, development right from the constitution to the policy and to the act that governs the water. And around this time, it was found that the capacity for water resources management was extremely low. And this around the time we joined the IHE to build that capacity. And of course, even with the water action plan on, there were many challenges. However, the water action plan helped us to establish the policy, the, frame, the illegal and the institutional framework, but also focus on obligations to international agreements and uh, transboundary water resources. I have looked here at the guiding principles that govern or guide our national water policy. I'll not go through them, but of very important one that I'm going to talk about is number D and G. Management of water resources at the lowest appropriate level, the essential role of women in provision, management, and safeguard of water. These are the various uh, enabling environment that we have, both at national, but also is cognizant of transboundary. And therefore, we have the Nile Basin Initiative Act 2002. We have the Lake Victoria Basin Protocol on Sustainable Development of Lake Victoria. And uh, right now, we also have the agreement on the Nile River Basin Cooperative Framework Act, uh, that's 2019, and other UN conventions. And this year, I think Uganda is also uh, acceding to the Water Convention. This is the structure. The staffing, as I told you yesterday when I started, as a lady I was the only manager, senior manager. But to date you can see, this year this was the International World, what the World Women's Day celebration. Uh, out of uh, uh, almost uh, 5,000, 4,000 staff, 1,557 are ladies, constituting 33% of the, 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 the staffing at different levels. Now, of course, as I've told you, there are very many challenges. The issue of efficiencies, ineffectiveness in service delivery was recorded. So in 2000, Uganda undertook sector institutional reform. There was a lot of fragmentation, poor coordination mechanism, low awareness, and so many others. So uh, the reform from 2002 started with studies at a different subsectoral level, but the focus today is the water resources management subsector reform from 2003 to 2005, which I'm going to talk about. Now the purpose was to establish an effective framework for water resources management in Uganda to ensure that water resources are managed and in an integrated and sustainable manner. Now, these studies found out that, uh, you know, 
Yeah, when you're in Uganda and you look at Lake Victoria, you think everywhere is water. So the population has false belief that there's water in abundance. There's weak coordination, low capacity, and so many others. Even the available water was not scientifically known. And the amount of water that was being consumed was actually very low, 1%. So uh, the reform for water resources management came out with strategic directions. One, to establish framework for deconcentration. This is like decentralizing water resources management, but not handing it to local government. It is the, the, the central government extending its facilitation to a lower level. So we have called it deconcentration, not decentralization. Amendment of the law to take in the emerging issues and establishment of the water resources management directory <coughs> to raise the profile of water resources management the country and also establish the Water Resources Institute. So these are the progress that we have made so far. Recall that uh, yesterday I said that uh, I joined as a commis assistant commissioner in the ministry, but as a director from 2015 to, date, to, to last year. So most of these I'm going to show, you will see where I have participated. Even when I was a commissioner, I was extremely participating in this. So uh, right now we have the Directorate of Water Resources Management established by cabinet decision, but we have also deconcentrated. I'm going to show you. We have done amendment of the law and is in progress for approval, but we have also raised the profile of transboundary water resources and established the Water Resources Institute and also raised issues of communication and stakeholder engagement. Now, the, what, the way I've chosen this is because when you leave IHG, you are full of knowledge and skills. But how to apply it in a dynamic environment is tailored to suit that. So that skill of applying is extremely important. So while we have stated all this, moving to action in Uganda is what I'm going to present. In terms of data and information and assessment studies, the paradigm shift that we had to take for centralized to decentralized, deconcentrated uh, IWRM, and also the institute and the other legal impacts. You can see from a manual station, we have upgraded to telemetric stations. Uh, the water quality has improved. We are now constructing that beautiful house, three quarter way as the National Reference Laboratory. And we have a very good system that is established for the database, national database, and the water information management system for water quality, for, 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 for regulation, water resources regulation, using permits, but also for water quantity. Now, in 2013, we did a water resources assessment because in 1995, the water resources assessment indicated that the amount of renewable fresh water is 66 billion cubic meters per year. But in 20, by 20, 20, 2011, it had reduced by 34%. And when you look at it, of this 43.3, uh, uh, much of it comes from outside Uganda in the upstream countries, 69%. That means only 31% is produced within the Uganda border. There are also emerging issues due to impacts of climate change, which are brought serious challenges, as you can see. Now, I would like to take you to two case studies of what uh, we have contributed to under my leadership uh, in terms of shifting the centralized management to a deconcentrated and, and using the guiding principle on management of water resources at the lowest appropriate level. Administratively, you know, hydrological drainage boundaries don't follow these administrative boundaries. So in Uganda, at central level, we have the ministry. But at local government, we have districts, counties, sub-county, parish, and villages. So for water resources, we decided to delineate using hydrological management zones. So the country is divided into four, as you can see. And we went ahead to establish a framework that can help in catchment-based integrated water resources management. And we deconcentrated our offices. We have offices in these four water management zones, 
established with our staff to facilitate uh, the stakeholders in water resources management. In uh, transboundary, we have also tried to delineate, you can see, uh, the Kagera Basin, the Siu Malaba Malakisi with the Kenya, we have the Albert with the Congo, Kagera Basin is with the Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi. So we are also using this same um, way to bring the IWRM into focus. Now, in Uganda, within, if we take, for example, the purple, I'm seeing it purple here or pink, within the purple area or pink, we now divide it again into catchments. And they are in the Kyoga Water Management Zone, which is on the right, there, we have 11 catchment management, catchment management sites. These are smaller units. And under catchment, we have sub-catchment and then micro-catchment. And at all these levels, there are structures, that institutions that manage the water resources and also enable us to protect and utilize it in a more organized way. I had put this, but I will not go through. In any catchment, this has been our demonstration. There are many users with conflicting issues. The fish want fresh water, but uh, you'll find that the wastewater being discharged, then the, 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 the electricity needs hydropower, but irrigation also needs water. So we use this to demonstrate to the community how we should bring all the interests together and then make sure that we uh, agree on how to optimize without necessarily uh, harming any other person. And also be mindful that the surface water is linked to groundwater. The implementation and coordination structures are as follows, right from the regional level, as I've shown you, with the, the, with the transboundary, national catchment, district level, and community level. And we use this, and we have used this to, to, to facilitate the different levels of government to embrace that holistic approach to water management is the best, and which brings all stakeholders together to discuss their interests, but also look at the threats that are available. It's a bit complicated, but this is what we have come up with. The highest level of, uh, uh, of catchment after the catchment management committee, which is headed by political leaders, supported by the technical, is the catchment stakeholder forum. Everybody have an annual meeting to discuss matters of the catchment. Now, we also have the catchment management plans developed for each catchment. There are 32 catchments in Uganda, and that provides a framework for interventions and also for mobilization of resources. So this is what we are doing, and we have provided guidelines on how stepwise each catchment should be able to develop a catchment management plan. And they are able to do it on their own because we only facilitate the process. And then when we have done the catchment management plans, we support them in mobilizing resources and then the interventions are done by the community. Now, in the, this is an example of a water catchment. They do the identification of the problems, the opportunities, they map and mobilize. We do this with the community. Now, I can show you this. At the beginning, this is a Ruizi catchment. The, the black, the, the soil, this is what we found when the wetlands was degraded. But the far last part is the most recent because the water here dried. Now water has come back and the environment has been restored. So the community are very active and now they're the ones policing these wetlands. If you are not a member of the catchment management committee, you cannot enter this part of the wetlands. These are some of the activities, tree planting and uh, fish Fish ponds are alternative sources of livelihood that we have created for the, for the, for the community. These are the ways of uh, catching the water so that we reduce on erosion. Then uh, the second part, because of time, I'll not go through, but these are key results that have come out of the catchment. We have been able to get all the water users and who need permits, but we are also monitoring we are also restoring banks and we are doing a lot of restoration of the catchment together with the communities. Now, uh, we, on the second case, where the reform said we should establish the Water Resources Institute, we, ha we established the institute in 2018. You can see that is the Right Honorable Prime Minister of the country, 
which commissioned the Water Resources Institute in Entebbe, and uh, all these, and the focus of this institute is on applied training, applied research, to enhance stakeholder dialogue and outreach. So I'll show you a few things that has happened so far. Now, under these achievements, uh, we have right now, the Water Resources Institute is now being recognized in the National Water Policy and the Act, but we have also come up with the retired professional schemes where all our professionals who retire are, have are registered and they become facilitators in the Water Resources Institute, as well as consultants where possible. We have 50 so far. We have also in the three years have frame, framework contract with them. We are training in different uh, topical issues that we see have impact or are affecting the community, including hydro diplomacy. And we have a lot of professionals who have offered to do this. And uh, you can see that the endorsement has been done. The last, last photo is our Minister of Water and Environment, uh, which is uh, launching uh, the, profession, the, the, the retired professional scheme. Uh, so it has caught that interest up to that highest level, where the ministers are now involved. We have strategic partnership with very many leaders, cultural leaders, faith-based organizations, NGOs, private sector, academia, the youth, they are all involved in strategic partnership and resource mobilization. And from zero, these are the different partners now we have. There are very many, and they continue growing every other time. In applied training, we are also doing a lot of training in laboratory water quality analysis, but we are also doing a lot of exhibition on local practical solutions to enhance our water resources access and management. We are also conducting a lot of hybrid physical online uh, conferences and collaborating greatly with all those that you can see. Up to 3,842 professionals have been trained in this place. We have designed SDG 6 training manual and we are using it because Uganda was one of the pilot countries for SDG 6 and therefore we have used that experience to come up with this manual and we are using it to train our people. The mentorship program. The mentorship program initially was intended to empower the young and mid-career women professionals to actually become more confident and uh, you know, take up the job equally with the men. And the entry level was a female and with the female graduates. So we trained two cohorts, but later on the, the young men began to complain because the women that had been trained were showing results and they were becoming threatened. So right now we decided that we have a mix. So the mentorship program, we use the retired professionals, successful people to come and mentor the, the, the staff and then allow them to really pick up and get confidence to move forward. We also have internship programs uh, uh, together with the United Nations uh, High Commission for Refugees. We have taken these and a lot of them are now being taken up by the same under the graduate training program. You can see this is the most recent uh, cohort of mentees who have graduated and uh, they are very happy. The stakeholder dialogue. In 2018, Uganda launched the Uganda Water and Environment Week. This was ideally uh, intended to, uh, to, to celebrate the World Water Day, but it changed to be a whole full month event with different, different stakeholders. And this has enabled us to really create awareness, disseminate information, and also engage with the participants at different levels. Not only in Uganda, it is now almost global with the, with the online systems. And you can see these are the different activities that we do in March in Uganda. There are pre-event activities, the event activities, and post-event activities. And they are different. You can see the Minister of Water Environment is flagging off workers, and they walk very long distances while trying to uh, talk to the community, 
and uh, let them know that you need to protect the environment, the climate is changing, the water is limited. So this is a very way, good way of sensitizing to us instead of sitting in the hotels. We work with the community. So you can see the workers are there and the minister, the permanent sector, everybody is embracing. This is the outreach. We use sports, we use schools, we use different activities. This year we had a run for the night and many people, including development partners, participated in this. The intention is to create awareness and create interest in water management, in the issues of climate change and environment management. So these have been very important areas that uh, we, I have participated in, of course at the head, but I work with the people. Because management is about you harnessing the potential of others so that you can achieve the objective. And as a leader, you must have a mechanism to influence those people and they believe in you so that they can follow you. Now, I want to say that one of my impacts is on the policy and practice through my few research work, which I'm really very proud of. At IHE, I did my master's research on constructed wetlands for wastewater treatment. And this has was been taken up very, very importantly in the industrial areas, in the, in the, in the National Water and Sewerage Corporation, but also it is one of the key models that the National Environment Management Authority has put in the, in the National Environment Act. The second one was the effect of pollution in drinking water, which was my research for MBA. I was invited to present my results at cabinet and it was taken because it showed the impact of indecision in wetlands encroachment and its impact on the water, which was a source for drinking water. So it led to the cancellation of titles in the wetlands demarcation and now Uganda's wetlands are all gazetted. Optimization and water efficiency was what I did for my doctorate and this has been taken up in the National Environment Act but also rationalization and restructuring of the National Environment Management Authority now has a full fully fledged division in resource efficiency and cleaner production arising from this. So I would think that these are very important achievements to me. And all these are also informing the revision of the national water policy and amendment of the act. Now I want to go just a little bit on transboundary issues. Because as I told you, Uganda's water resources is transboundary. Uganda needs to look at it nationally, but also from a wider perspective of a regional angle. Now you know that 63 major transboundary rivers exist in Africa and covers about 64% of the continent. It had, of course, this has a number of dimensions that we must cooperate in working together. The challenges are many, ranging from the fact that Africa is facing a lot of extreme events, there's pollution increasing, climate is changing, and then most rivers are not, are not tapped, but also they are unevenly, unevenly distributed. So uh, African Network of Basins Organization brings in all the basins of Africa together to look at how best we can work together to support the African vision by networking, strengthening our institutions, having peer-to-peer -peer learning, and also looking at investments and resource mobilization and what we can coordinate and do together and share information and best lessons from other areas. The headquarters is in Senegal. Currently, the Nile Basin Initiative is the president of the African Network of Basins. And therefore, while I do the work of the Nile Basin, I also have the role to coordinate all the activities of the basins in Africa. This is a very common story of the Nile, the longest river in the world, but I would want to say that it has a lot of challenges. The Nile Basin is about 10% of Africa in terms of land coverage and hosts about a quarter of the population of Africa. 
so it is densely populated. Most parts of the basin is arid and semi-arid, and 80% of the water originate from a very small part of the basin, which is prone to regular climate extremes. Most current uses are in the arid semi-desert. Most underdeveloped are the upstreams. Nile Basin is a home to diverse cultures, fragile ecosystems, world-class environmental assets, and the rest. It has a number of challenges, a number of opportunities. And our work is to harness these opportunities so that we are able to solve the various challenges. And now to do this, the Council of Ministers in 1999 established the Nile Basin Initiative. This was established among 10 countries, which I think I'll put them there, I'll not go through them, with Eritrea, the 11th, as, a, as a, an observer. By that time, South Sudan was not born. So, the only basin-wide institution mandated to facilitate cooperative development and management of the shared water resources on behalf of the 10 countries is the Nile Basin Initiative. The Council of Ministers at governance level came out with a shared vision, and this was one of the very important strengths. We have the shared vision to achieve sustainable economic development through the equitable utilization of and benefit from the common Nile Basin water resources. We have aligned ourselves to core values, teamwork, transparency, integrity, respect for diversity, professionalism, and innovation. Core functions are linked to facilitating basin cooperation, water resources management planning, and water resources management, water resources development. These are the three core functions. The organization structure is headed by the Council of Ministers. The Nile Basin Initiative have two other as a secretariat and two investment arms. The secretariat is in Entebbe, one investment arm is in Kigali, and the other one is in Addis Ababa. So this is the, the structure. We have a strategy that guides us. You can see that our strategies, uh, the goals are aligned to the SDGs. They align also to the African vision and align to many other international uh, commitments and obligations that the countries prescribe to. We have a number of benefits because of time. I did want to go through a lot of them. But the fact that the 10 countries agreed on a shared vision was a success. They agreed to sit on a round table and discuss matters of cooperation on the basin. We currently have a very strong institutional framework and common platform where dialogue and engagement takes place. We have capacity building program that uh, have seen 40,000 citizens benefit from this. And we do a lot of support to cooperatively plan, develop and manage the resource. There are joint investments that have been identified to the tune of 6.5 billion U.S. dollars, of which 1.3 billion U.S. dollars is mobilized. There are other projects and programs that we can demonstrate that cooperation is the best. Currently, we have the Rusum Hydropower project that has just been completed, which is shared by Burundi, Tanzania, and Rwanda. And already they are receiving power from this. This is synchronized grid for power trade. And over 3,000 kilometers of electricity transmission lines have been established to, to try to, to, to take the electricity to the areas of need. We have a lot of knowledge products, which I would want to invite IHE to look at on our website, over 10,000 of them, which are very important on the Nile. We are now having the hydromet stations in the whole, we measure most of the parts of the basin that we use for uh, real-time monitoring of the water and then uh, uh, forecast and uh, provide early warning information to the countries. We are also developing a center of excellence for Nile Basin so that the secretariat becomes the hub and the museum for Nile Basin uh, 
information, my contribution. When I was the director of water resources management, as the head of the technical and advisor to government on matters of water resources management, I had to participate in the negotiations. And we had to head all the team lead delegation who are going out of the country discussing matters on water resources. Uh, therefore, I was, the, I was the principal Nile technical advisor to government of Uganda. And also heading the delegation, as I've told you, but also looking at various policies, projects and programs which are transboundary in nature and those that can benefit Uganda and the neighbors that we share the water with. Also, of course, as host of the Secretariat or for the Nile Basin Initiative, the host always have a role to play to support the Secretariat. Now, uh, as Executive Director now, my work, I think yesterday I talked about it, I will not again repeat. I have to do the leadership, strategic leadership, but also provide, facilitate cooperation platform for dialogue, confidence building and trust building among the member states, but also coordinate with different partners to provide the rightful information, but also to invite them to support the, the necessary programs and projects of the Nile Basin. Stakeholder engagement is very core and continuous, and we do this at different levels using different models. That is why, uh, Maria, we always meet in the international events because at the side of it, we always have a, an event for Nile Basin. And the intention is to continually in, engage with the stakeholders at different levels to share with them benefits of cooperation and the challenges and how we are moving forward. So we do this in various modes, using the Nile Basin Development Forum. We use the Nile Day celebration on 22nd of February every year. We took this year, we were in the 10th World Water Forum, the World Water Week. All these are used under different opportunities for diplomatic engagement, in addition to the governance meetings that we hold. Of course, as I've told you, investment in the region is important for us, ED, to make sure that what the countries have approved of comes to reality on the ground. I also do the coordination activities of activities, and as I've told you, NBI is the knowledge hub. And we have decided, because one of our values is transparency, all our documents that we do want to share with the partners are on website. So we invite you, please, to, to check on them. And if you have any that you will need, please, I'll be there to, to support you. Capacity building, we have now the young and the, the gender and the youth empowerment program. We have the e-learning courses. We have the internship and young professionals program for our capacity building. We have a number of other activities and the women's participation in NBI events have increased up to 20%. You can see this is the Nile Basin Initiative. Women, uh, the number of women against the number of, of, of men. The Nile Basin Initiative uh, uh, recruits only Nile Basin citizens. And uh, we use the expertise in the, in the, within the, the basin to do the different activities. But where we are not, we invite consultants from different parts of the world to support us. Currently, we are having only ladies. You can see at the corner there, the young women professionals from Ethiopia, South Sudan, Sudan, are the ones with the intention to promote women's participation and enhance their capacity in handling matters of transboundary cooperation. This is intentional because for a long time it has been purely men. So we are trying to catch up. Thank you very much for listening. I really want to acknowledge, first of all, my government for giving me the opportunity to do the various things that I've done. Yesterday I told you that I, I like doing things beyond what people think I can do. And I think uh, the government saw it and they have given me the opportunity. I really want to appreciate. 
the Netherlands government is difficult to, to, to forget because all that I am and that I say is because of this institute with the support from the government of the Netherlands. I want to thank the development partners, international agencies for the great support in the different areas, in the Nile Basin, family, IHE Delft, my own family, I told you yesterday, friends and IHE participants for investing in me through education, turning me into a professional and entrusting me with the responsibilities that continue to impact lives. I want to thank you very much for listening to me. If you want more information, we have that website and other details. And I'm available and I will be very happy to receive you online, but also in person, in the basin. I want to thank you very much once again. Thank you very much, Florence. And if there are some uh, questions, please do not hesitate. We are going to speak loud so the question can be recorded. Please, Professor. Florence, I'd just like to thank you. You're very generous with your acknowledgments. I think we at IHG Delft are just pleased to have been able to be a part of your journey and support where we could. But you've clearly gone on to, to just enormous accomplishments. And it's so exciting to see how you've been so involved in the important development processes in the basin. And it's, it's also very nice, as you also acknowledged, to see that uh, your contributions are so well appreciated by the government of Uganda and the, just the confidence that the government and the other member states of the Nile Basin have placed in you and in your role as, as ED now. So thank you for all of that. I was curious if you could say a little bit more about the center of excellence that's under development and what, uh, what might that be? Okay, I can answer. Yes, thank you very much, Lisa. The center of excellence uh, is focused to put all the knowledge and information on the basin in one stop point, but also use the lessons learned to, uh, to, to, to build capacity of the Nile Basin citizens and also en enhance research and innovation in, the, in other areas concerning integrated water resources management and the Nile Corporation uh, framework. So it and now it is also intended to look at, especially in this dynamic world, how do you manage the shared water resources in an environment of extreme events, in an environment where the population is increasing, in an environment where pollution is increasing, because there's a lot of complex pollutants now which is entering the night. And that makes the water, what we have, even less in terms of active use. So the Center of Excellence would want to package all this information, liaise with other relevant institutions to up the research part, build capacity, use information that we have gathered to inform others, uh, come up with a museum for the Nile, and be the hub for any information that you'd want on water, environment, or climate change within the basin. That is what it intends to do. Thank you. So it will be a real brick and mortar institution yes. with yes. staff? And, yes. All right. Yes. So, mm. Thanks. Thank you. And will you be inviting IHG Delft to uh, collaborate on this, on the uh, Center of Excellence? I already told the rector about the Center of Excellence and then the, the, the possible uh, opportunities for partnership. Actually, IHC already had an MOU which expired with the NBI. And I think uh, the director had the guided that I would meet one of you to see how we can reactivate. Mm -hmm. Because we have the young professionals and internship program. IHC has that. 
we are looking at research, we are looking at knowledge hub, education, and there's a lot that is common that we can do together. He was also telling me about the digital museum, which we are now also interested in to share experience on how it is happening so that we can link up together. So there's a lot of opportunity, that's what I can say, for working together. Thank you. Susanna? Uh, I was so intrigued to hear how you connected your thesis, your master's thesis research, with the national, uh, I think it was the national environmental. Yes. That, that was very intriguing. And then your PhD also influenced the policy. Mm -hmm. And I'm particularly interested in the MSc, since that was at IHE. Can you just talk a little bit more about how your MSc research has actually influenced policy? That's so fascinating. Okay, uh, by the time we did our MSc, uh, a lot of research had been done on natural wetlands. Uh, and uh, the late uh, Professor Denny, rest in peace, as our supervisor, we decided to see how we can actually understand what the wetlands can do in terms of absorbing eh, nutrients eh, from the waste so that we can polish the water better before this year. So we went into a constructed wetland, you know, a laboratory to check what is coming in, what is going out and measure all these. And my focus was on phosphate and I used the phragmatis, phragmatis uh, to do my work. And uh, we constructed this in Jinja and Uganda and uh, used the effluent after the anaerobic uh, digestion, the water that moved out was then pushed into the, into the wetlands. And uh, we continued to monitor and uh, we found that exactly that it had a lot of contribution in uptake of the phosphate, of the nutrients, as long as you managed it. That means that if the phragmites had grown to a certain level, you needed to, to cut, okay? You need to cut, harvest it, and therefore find its other use. And in the community, there is use for phragmites. So this is what came out. And therefore, in Uganda, most of the effluents that are discharged do not go through tertiary treatment. So it was a very important opportunity now to establish uh, the wetlands before the after the, the, the secondary treatment, where you remove a lot of bacteria and what, and then the polishing is done by the constructed wetlands. So this has been used in the municipal wastewater treatment, final effluent polishing. It is also being used by some of the industries. So, and it is a low cost technology, as long as you have land. So this is why it has been adopted as one of the options that could be utilized as long as you have land, to make sure that you remove as much as possible of the nutrients before discharge into the water body. Thank you. No problem. I'm so intrigued by the fact that only people from the, the wetland areas are allowed into the wetland areas. They've created a kind of nature reserves from the wetlands, which are obviously very uh, important uh, carbon sinks, as well as many other ecosystem um, services they provide. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sorry, I didn't. Could you, could you tell us more about the, the, um, the wetland uh, reserves that have been? The Gazette? Yeah. Uh, okay. You see, uh, because of increased population, uh, uh, and the lack of space, uh, there's been a lot of uh, wetlands encroachment. And also extreme events. When there's a drought, everybody's looking for water, agriculture, so people have started, have started destroying the, the wetlands. Now, especially in Kampala, the Kampala, the earlier Kampala during the colonial time, had 
looked at waste effluent as being uh, pre-treated by wetlands before entering into the lake. But because there are so many people, the, the development took place and the wetlands got destroyed. So my research showed that we needed to do something. And therefore I did the water quality and uh, came out, tracked most of the content of what was in the water back to the industries and the activities in the environment, which needed a quick action. And uh, at the beginning, <laughs> it wasn't taken, but uh, one day I had briefed my minister. He called me and told me, please bring me those scaring things and we go. So I, I went with my minister and I made the presentation. And the presentation was about delayed in taking action and its impact on the water quality. So once this was presented, it was really very convincing that action and the action had to be taken. So first, they started with the cancelling land titles and telling everybody who is there to leave the place. But secondly, to make it more legal now, was to gazette all the wetlands. So once it is gazetted, that means it is a no-go area. And if you are going there, you must have permission. And if you are going to use any part, it must be a regulated activity under the National Environment Act. So that is what has happened. And uh, luckily enough, I have also been a member of the board of the National Environment uh, Management Authority of Uganda. So I used that opportunity to put in place to make sure that whatever I understand and how we do it would convince the board members to move it forward. So that is how it, it has happened. And, uh, we, there are many wetlands that have been already destroyed, which needs restoration. There are those which can no longer be restored, and we have classified them, but the rest that can be restored have been gazetted in the whole country. And how much, uh, how much the country does that cover? Is that so, percentage? Sorry? How much, what percentage would that be of, of land? Oh, of land. Yeah. It's, it's about 9% that has, that has been intact, but now we are trying to restore others because the, the original was, uh, I think, 15% of wetlands. Then it kept on being destroyed, but now we are on a positive trajectory trying to restore and move up. The intention is to have at least 13% restored. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for one extra question. Somebody would like? If not, I would like to say thank you very much, Florence, you. for your fantastic work, for being a very engaged alumna of IHE Delft, and it has been a real honor to have this seminar and this explanation of you and your presence at IHE Delft. Thank you. Thank you very much and all the best for your brilliant career. Thank you very much.